A ceremony will take place in Dallas later. It's actually the first official event the city has held to commemorate President Kennedy's assassination. I've been speaking to Peter Ling, who's Professor of American Studies from the University of Nottingham, about the kind of man John F. Kennedy was. Well, he was a very mysterious kind of person, a bit of an enigma. On the surface, was extremely cool, calm and uh, witty. But in private, he could be quite crude and angry and fairly crass. He would sometimes treat people as if they were mere servants, and at other times he would be incredibly generous and kind and charming. He was an incredibly sick person. He's probably the illest man ever to become president of the United States. In what way was he ill? He had a very serious underlying problem with his adrenal glands. This was called Addison's disease, a form of Addison's disease that meant that his autoimmune system was very compromised and he got lots of infections. Uh, He took steroids to treat this and a side effect of the steroids was that uh, the bones in his back had started to crumble when he was already in his um, early 40s. He had an operation in the early 50s to fuse the vertebrae together. But this is somebody who is in pain almost every day of his adult life, and yet he doesn't show it. People aren't aware that this man who looks so glamorous is in fact so much an invalid. 50 years on from his death, he's still seen as such an iconic figure. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it is that he sticks in people's memories so much? He was a man who came along at a moment when the politicians in the rest of the world were old men from the past. And here he was, the young hero from the Second World War, a man in his 40s with an even younger wife and uh, and children under the age of five. He represented the future. He was, in a sense, somebody who signaled the coming of a new generation, as he said. He is remembered because of that transition and also because of television. He was very astute in the way he handled television and the way in which the family created this Uh, these wonderful photo opportunities to make sure that he was memorable because of the way he looked and the way his wife looked. And, And they charmed the American people and indeed the world. And what sort of legacy did he leave in terms of US politics, do you think? Well, it's really quite a mixed legacy because on one level, it's his father's money that allows him to run almost as his own candidate, not as just as the Democratic Party candidate. So he kicks American politics into a whole new level of spending. He's also the first celebrity politician who seems to be elected more from the image he projects than the policy he advocates. And he's also, to some extent, a model of electing a politician who is going to take risks and is going to be more dynamic in a very dangerous world. So to some extent, um, he's quite a frightening model for the future. The other legacy, of course, is that he inspired a lot of optimism. There's an enormous confidence about uh, JFK, which politicians have always found uh, to be something they want to imitate. You talk about this confidence. Would, do you think he would have been a shoe in to win a second term had he have survived? I do think he would have beaten the likely candidate, Barry Goldwater, in 64, but he probably would not have beat him as much as Lyndon Johnson did in the wake of Kennedy's death. The 64 landslide is, in a sense, a vote for the Democrats because their president has been murdered. He would have beaten Goldwater, but he'd have been a pretty much middle-of-the-road president, I think. I think he would have wanted to be uh, safe on foreign policy and safe on domestic policy. He wouldn't have been as ambitious as Johnson was. That's Professor Peter Ling and movie director Oliver Stone, who made the 1991 film JFK, will be a guest on Five Live Breakfast with Nikki and Rachel after 8 o'clock. Dame Tessa 